episode of the She Dreams in Color interview series where we discuss women's occupations and obstacles. And I'm going to tell you right now, I get excited every episode, James, I do. <laughs> but today I have James Alsop with me. We've known each other for several years yes. through the community, but I'm delighted that James is here to talk about her occupation as a choreographer. Um, not just because it's a fantastic job, but also because of all of the places James's work has shown up. And it just is exciting to see, like, I know the person who did the things. <laughs> and you knew me way before when, honey. You knew me way back when. We've known each other for so long. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. Thank you. And I am positive that your story of how you found your occupational journey is going to inspire so many other people who hear it. And that's what we're here to do is expose people to jobs. Because yes. choreographer seems so out of reach for people. Yeah. Um, I know the number one thing people say is you co-choreographed Beyonce's music videos. What yes. songs were they? What videos? My first music video that I ever choreographed as a choreographer, like, that I ever worked on as a choreographer, was Run the World. Oh, God. And then Wait, that... I just got goosebumps. <laughs> what? <laughs> no pressure. First job. Say, I can't, right. I can't even believe I can say that. It's wild to me. And then I stayed on with her for a couple years, actually. I worked on Dance For You and Love On Top and some of her live shows. I worked with her for a while. I'm so thankful to her and the entire team because they turned my life around. I'm so, so thankful. That, it, it, where do you go from here? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, it was, it was why after that, because of the team that I was working with, Frank Gatson was her creative director at the time. And he really brought me on to work with incredible people. I worked with Jennifer Lopez after that and Kelly Rowland. And it snowballed from there. Thank goodness uh, uh, people wanted to have me around because you still walk around with that insecurity in whatever position you're in. You want to be your best. But then it's just like, well, what's next? I mean, yeah, I'm sorry. Like, am I going to stay with her forever? What do I do? But then I've been lucky enough to stick around and to work with some incredible people. And I also love the range and diversity of your work because you've done Broadway yes. um, and you've also done the new Whitney Houston movie. Yes. So that is a feature film. Yes. And then you did Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt, which yes. is a series. Yes. And so it shows up in all these different ways, yes. which really has to be fulfilling that your work can influence a lot of different spectrums. It is incredibly fulfilling mainly for me because uh, the dancer life has such a short lifespan as a dancer. And so you have to think about your next step, but I always knew that I wanted to continue in the dance world, and especially choreography. I just love to create movement. But I also never wanted to be pigeonholed into one type of dance, one genre. I want to make sure that if I say I dance, I can just dance. You throw it at me and I can give it to you. Uh, and so thankfully I've been able to, you know, cross genres and like go into new worlds like when I did the pre-Broadway run for Devil Wears Prada. It's such a different world and it's also a challenge. It opens up my mind in places that I never thought of and so it's been it's been really really fulfilling and I'm really grateful for it. Oh my goodness. So James let's go all the way back. How long did you want to be a, a dancer into a choreography? Well I think the day I was born I was smacked on my butt and did a pirouette when I came out of the womb. <laughs> <laughs> I I can I honestly can't remember the moment when I knew I wanted to be a choreographer because it was always in me. I was always dancing. I just danced, I moved. And then when I was like 5 or 6, I was creating movement on my sisters and my brother and I was like, "No, it's on 5, not 6. Do it again." <laughs> I was that when I was that young. And then after finding out who Janet Jackson's choreographers were, Debbie Allen, Bob Fosse, I was like, "I want to be them. I want to emulate what they do. I'm really, really inspired by them specifically. And I was like, oh, they're behind the camera. And they're really, they're the ones actually cultivating a culture of dance. Mm. And that's what I wanted to do. How did you get exposure to them? Because I love finding out how we see the people that we idolize. Yes. Uh, I have to, I think I have to really thank my older sisters 
every Sunday, every Saturday, you know, you wake up and you, the music's bumping, but you got to do your chores. So my mom knows we hated to get up, but she knew it would be fun if we danced doing it. So my parents just loved music, hearing the music the whole time and then just moving to it. And that feeling that I would get just being like seeing my mom dance. And then she's like sleeping or doing the dishes and we're vacuuming and we're vacuuming, but performing. It was just the feeling that came over me. And I was like, I want to keep this feeling forever. And that was really, that was really the big catalyst for mm. me. That was the big exposure was just the music. And then music videos, of course. Mm. You had the Saturday Night Countdown, five videos. So Michael Jackson, Janet Jackson, Janet Jackson's my everything. So all of her videos were my exposure. I call Janet my reason why. <laughs> and you had MTV growing up. Yes. So that yes. exposure that we had with MTV being, yes. I mean, everybody sat around MTV. Everybody, <laughs> I mean, it was a thing. The kids nowadays have no clue. It was a thing to sit in front of the TV and wait for a video to premiere. I love that feeling. And it was the excitement of it. And I really, I wanted to be a part of that. I was like, how did that, like how does this come together? How does this come to life? So it just sparked my curiosity with MTV and then VH1, BET, all of it just sparked my curiosity. It's like, how do I do it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then we had um, the advantage of seeing behind the scenes yes. because cable television yes. had to create more content. So yep. then we got the exposure of the who behind the scenes. Yes. For sure. Behind the music, making the video, oh, Access Granted, all of those shows. I, it really, they were more exciting for me than the actual video itself. Me too. I loved seeing how it comes to life. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, there are, they're not going to know who Tina Landon is. Oh, she's, there's somebody beside the camera telling, doing the moves and reminding them. I wanted to be that person. It was really that exposure for me, specifically behind the scenes that really just garnered my interest. And like, so if you have exposure like that, it just shows you that it is an occupation and it yes. is something you can pursue. Absolutely. Like Save the Last Dance, you got served. Um, I love I love all the dance films. Even going back to like Sweet Charity, Cabaret, all that jazz, those are the films that really also made me realize that this could be a thing, but it, it provided a sense of escapism. And then when I realized how important art was, and especially the art of dance and the art of movement, to really provide a, a sense of escapism for people or to provide a means of feeling good or mm -hmm. to make people really understand the importance of art. Dance film is, has always been that for me. And mm -hmm. of course, Debbie Allen, she did everything and I wanted to be her. <laughs> So. <laughs> understandable, understandable. So what about, um, you know, something you said that I think is interesting to dive into a little bit, if you're comfortable, yeah. is how dance made you feel good in your body. Yes. And then another parallel conversation we hear frequently um, from trans identified people yes. is not feeling comfortable in their body. Right. How did those two worlds collide or uh, intersect or overlap? When it came to dance and when it came to movement, I mean, I just, I knew at four that I was born in the wrong body. I knew when I was four years old. And you have a twin brother. I have a twin brother identical twin brother one of my he's my best friend he's my person and I just I just knew because I just felt like one of the girls granted when I was four that was what 1988 there was no language for trans but then I would see Janet Jackson and I would see Michael Jackson my brother was obsessed with Michael I was obsessed with Janet but then I was like I don't relate to the male I don't it's just not a thing so then when I would see her body I would emulate her and I would imitate what she was doing Whitney Houston I mean she's not really like a dancer but just seeing how she moved and how she was poised my mother the way she walks and the way my mom danced I would want to dance like her uh, and so then when the music came on there was this freedom where I didn't get in trouble I did not get in trouble for how I moved and I was like oh or at least I wasn't looked at crazy. There was like this power in it. And I was like, this can be, it also became a defense mechanism because it was just like, well, I can do this and get away with it and be safe as opposed to like walking down the street. And so it was really, they were really intermingled, me identifying as trans and knowing I was in the wrong body, but then being able to move in that body freely mm. as a young person. I loved it. Mm. So a calling and also liberating and also Absolutely. a safety net and yes. also a passion. And, yes. yeah. and it became, dance kind of became my voice for what I didn't know I couldn't say. Mm. <clears throat> Excuse me. So it was whatever I, whatever words couldn't come to mind, if I could perform it, people saw it and they understood it. And I didn't even know how to express it. So that was another huge part of me realizing this is I mean, life-saving to a certain extent. Mm. How uh, did your journey to um, identify openly and outwardly, particularly to your brother and to your family, how did that unfold? 
It was, I started, what is this, 2023? <laughs> <laughs> I started transitioning in 2015. Uh, and it was, I mean, if you knew me before, it was pretty soon to come. (laughs) (laughs) I always loved makeup when I was like five or six. I'm incriminating myself, but we would go to the grocery store and I would, my parents wouldn't let me get fingernails. So I would like sneak them and I (laughs) was a little klepto. (laughs) Yeah. But I would sneak it because it was like a piece of me that I got to, you know, experience. And then, of course, I was out and proud my whole life when I was identifying as gay. Out and proud. But I was just like, I was gay because I was told I was gay when I was four. I would go to my kindergarten class and my I would put on this blue spaghetti strap dress and I would wrap my head in a scarf. And they had those little tykes kitchens that emulated, like, made that cooking sound. And I would serve the whole class breakfast. Because <laughs> that's what my mom would do. And my teacher pulled me to the side and she's like, you know, I mean, it's okay to be gay. You don't have to put on the dress, though. And I was like, well, I don't think I'm gay because, you know, I know the gay boys love them, but I'm one of the girls. But because I didn't have the language, I literally was just, I was told I was gay, so I was gay at four. Oh, how interesting. And I grew up thinking, just knowing I was gay, but then, when the language started to come about, when the trans identifying language came about, I was like, that's me. And so I was actually talking to my sister first, my oldest sister. And she was like, okay, I mean, I don't get it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but she was like, okay, who cares, be you. And my brother, of course, he could care less. We literally were roommates. Like there's <laughs> nothing that could separate us. <laughs> yeah. And so it was kind of, it was easy. It was easy transitioning literally with my family because when you transition, so do they. And so it was easier than I expected, I should say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, A very fortunate outcome in your case, at least um, in the closest people in your network. We don't hear so many stories of being that. So fortunately you had your brother who was so close to you and and now there's two of you that can say, this is what we're all doing together as a family. Um, And then what was it like professionally? Because I don't know anything about the dance world. And you were a dancer first. Yes, dancer first. It was harder, I think, in the dance world, especially when I was coming up. Now it's okay to be you. But when I was coming up in the dance world about 15 years ago, 15 years ago, yeah, I moved to LA in 2006. <clears throat> it was really difficult, especially being as femme as I was. And we called ourselves the Lady Boys back then. It was myself and my two other best friends at the time. But we were specialty acts. Like people wouldn't hire us because they didn't know how to deal with us because we were so effeminate. But it was really difficult because the female identifying people in the dance world would get lauded and praised for dancing like men. If they danced hard or if they danced rough, they were praised and they were like, yes, that's how you do it. But for those of us who could do that, but also we could dance really femininely, we, it was really difficult for us to get booked. It was really difficult for us to be taken seriously for so long. And I think a lot of us did pave the way because we just had to stop caring. We, the love of dance was so strong and the passion was so overwhelming that it was like, okay, you can't break my soul. <laughs> but literally we had to really keep at it. And now I'm so thankful we did because people can literally be who they are. Lil Nas X went on tour with a bunch of men who are openly gay and openly proud. And I'm so thankful to see that now because when I was coming up, it was really difficult to see that. And then thank God for the Britney Spears and the Janets because they also, had dancers like Nick Flores, Brian Friedman, all of these dancers who I looked up to who were being themselves and being free on stage. and But it was really difficult to get to that spot because there were only like enough spaces for those people. There wasn't a lot of space for us to occupy. And I think it was much more difficult to transition. However, when I transitioned is when I really feel like my career started to flourish. When I was being true to myself and in my true self is when my career really started to take off, I think. Mm, That's fascinating. And also affirming that you being authentic, there was a space to welcome you. Absolutely. I really noticed that too. I was having a conversation with my dad. Because, I mean, of course, you have difficult conversations. And I had to really, we were just talking and I pointed out, I was like, but my career really started to take off when I started being honest with myself. And when he, like, I could see the light bulb click. 
in him. And it was really affirming to see that in him as well, to be like, oh, you're right. Because, of course, when you move to L.A., you move across the country and they worry about you 24-7. Leave me alone. No, I'm good. Ah." (laughs) But then, and it was, they've seen my entire career and it was really difficult at first. And so he really, he just wanted me to have stability. And when that happened, when I started being my true authentic self, he was really proud of me. And I was like, oh, that's a really, that's a thing. Thanks, Dad. (laughs) And sometimes as a parent, you think, like, hide whatever that is Mm -hmm. keeping you from getting the opportunity. (coughs) Yes. But that translates into hide who you are. Yes. But it's actually, we yes. we want you to be like everybody else just so you can find success like everybody yes. else. And as, it was as a young person who swore they knew everything, <laughs> <laughs> it was really hard for me to make that connection at first. I don't have children, so I don't understand the parental concern. But I did end up realizing that it just comes from a place of fear and not fear of like of the world but fear for their child your parent just wants the best for you i did not come to this realization i lie to you not until about last month <laughs> mm-hmm. and i was like i'm 39 now and this whole time i was like yeah, i don't get it but it was just my parents just wanted the best for me and up to what they knew they didn't know the dance world they didn't know about being trans. They just wanted me safe. Mm-hmm. And it came wanting someone to be safe means that you fear for their safety. Yeah. And I really didn't make that connection out of, it's weird that it comes out of love and concern. Yeah. And I'm just like, oh my God, you aren't proud of me. You don't want me to be myself. Yeah. No, you just wanted me to be safe. And mm-hmm. now I understand that. I promise you, I, it's so funny you brought that up because I did not come to this realization until right after my birthday last month. I was like, Oh, this mm-hmm. is what it means. Oh, you care about me. I get it. <laughs> yeah. It has to be hard to communicate and also receive. Yes. And especially when there are so many headlines of yes. trans identified black women, particularly yes. targeted and um, yes. brutalized. And yes. also at the same time, alternatively, not protected Absolutely. in our country. And even in Charlotte, we're yeah. one of the more dangerous cities for yeah. trans identified black women. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure that just stokes a lot of concern Absolutely. for your safety. Um, but so many times we also hear I didn't have another choice either Mm -hmm. I had to be myself I had to be authentic yes I there I couldn't live another day without being it was it was also just taxing to like feel like you're living a double life I feel like I'm not being honest with myself I'm not being honest with my people I'm not being honest with my tribe it's exhausting it is absolutely draining to sit here and be like yeah okay and then go home and be like oh I can be myself, but then you have to walk out of the door and you put on a brave face to be who you think everybody else wants you to be. But to really live in my truth, it was, I could not live another day without being honest with myself. And and even though you put yourself out there and it is so difficult with how specifically black trans women are the most attacked in our community and the most unprotected, I, I could not live another day without being Huh. <laughs> um, so uh, I don't know if you've talked about this before, but what was the choice and how was the decision made to keep is James the name you were born with? Yes. I assumed. Yes. How did that decision come to yes. pass? Because I think that's uncommon for it's, a lot. We hear a lot of people not keep the name assigned to them. At right. Birth. Right. I, I, I did not like the term dead name. I hate that so many women have to go through that, but I didn't want to have a dead name. It's also, honestly, (laughs) it's like my middle finger to societal constructs. I I don't feel any different. I felt this way since I was four, basically since I was born. So I'm not a different person. I don't feel the need to change my name because James is who she is. And it's regal, it's royal. I just feel, you know, like a princess. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> so it was it was literally that simple for me. I just never felt different. I never felt like I had to really change my name because I'm just like I feel like I've been her since anyone has met me. So I'm James. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I love that. I thank you for sharing that. Of course. It's such an interesting way of looking at it because and I wonder if that is um 
unique to journeys like your own mm-hmm. where it, it wasn't as, um, and I don't want to say not as traumatizing, but I, I wonder if some people on the same journey say, no, that was a different person. Right. Yes. I, I do not want to be associated with that anymore. Absolutely. I, my, I can only speak to my experience and I'm, I know for a fact actually that there are so many people who literally hid who they were. So many trans women who hid who they were before they started living authentically in their truth. And for that, yes, break free, rise from the ashes, Phoenix. Go for it. And I, a lot of that actually for the trans women who came before me, because of that, it was just like, well, now I want to be firm in who I am. I want to stand firmly in who I am. And because of that, it's my initials. I didn't want to change my initials. I like the fact of having a twin. I like the way our names sound together, James and Jeremy. I'm like, oh, I don't want to change any of that. But I know that a lot of women aren't afforded the opportunity. They have to literally disassociate in order to really live freely. And I love that. And I'm thankful for that. Also, I never saw... When I was young, I think like of my nine-year-old self. I never saw a me growing up. I didn't have that. There, were, I really didn't even have trans people to really look up to when I was nine. I'm so thankful we are out and proud and here and taking up space now. But I really wanted to be that person for nine-year-old James because I didn't see it. At the time, all I had was RuPaul. Love me some RuPaul. <laughs> but I knew that I wasn't a drag queen and I didn't want to really be associated as such i wanted to be i needed to live my life as a woman and i just didn't know where to turn Mm. i didn't know who to go to i didn't know who to talk to i didn't know what to look up and so also a huge part of it for me is just making it possible and making it known for other trans people that it's okay to if that's your journey it is totally okay to come up and still you know if you want to keep your name Mm. but if you don't child and i thought trust me I went through a list. I had a list of names, honey. <laughs> <laughs> I went through the list, and I was like, you know what? Why? Mm-hmm. Why do I have to? I, it's not for me. Love the girls who do it. Love the people who do it. But I, it's just like mm, to society and societal constructs. <laughs> well, and, and that co- construct of saying that James is a boy's name. Yes. Even that part. Yeah, yes. you're right. To it's assume so, that James has to be a boy's yes. name. Yes. And yeah. I, I did get asked a lot, especially when I first started my transition, if I was going to change my name. I was like, well, do you ask a girl named Michael if she's going to change hers? Or do you ask a guy named Shannon? But that was for the people who were being rude about it. Yeah. Who were being, in- not rude, intrusive. And I'm like, well, no, I mean, but. And then when that happened, they were like, I never thought of it that way. Yeah. So then I stopped using it as a defense mechanism. And I was just like, oh, this could be a teaching moment. Yeah. And then I found the power in that as well. So mm. I stuck with it. Well, thank you for that. Because yes. um, I appreciate when people are here and they feel comfortable to take advantage of an opportunity to educate when they're ready for it. Yes. You know, yes. everything is such an evolution and you're Absolutely. not always ready to share those parts. So it's incredibly valuable when someone is ready to share that part and the thought process behind it and mm-hmm. the why, because there are people looking for guidance yes. at some point. Yes. Um, and they, it's not beneficial to hear the information from someone like me. <laughs> it's better <laughs> to hear it from someone who's gone through it. Yes and can at least give that personal experience to it. But it's also so helpful and so thankful that you provide a space where someone can feel safe enough (laughs) to have the space to speak on it and to speak on it safely. It's so incredibly moving. I'm so Mm -hmm. thankful. I'm so, so thankful to be able to do that here. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me in order just to be able to speak on it. Thank you. So thankful. Well, and you spoke to something that is, is our motivation is be the thing nine-year-old James needed. Yes. You know, I think we can look back on our lives at a certain point and say, if I had had this, then this. Yes. Um, And if I had had role models in different occupations, my Mm -hmm. life would have been opened a lot sooner to possibilities. And maybe that would have prevented some trauma and some bad decisions and some harmful decisions. Um, And then the obstacles that we all go through through sometimes we can be at such a low we don't know that we're ever going to get through that what does it look like to get through this obstacle especially when you're looking up just ready to scream for help and you don't know where to turn yeah i cannot fathom somebody out there in this world especially with the legislations happening right now sorry not to get political but there's there are people out there who are coming into their own who don't have 
the go to. They don't know where to turn. And I, knowing that I have this platform, I have to be that person for somebody. I have no idea who I'm going to reach. Hopefully, I can t- if I touch one person, that's enough. Yeah. Just to know that some people, knowing what I've gone through, I need to put as much information out there to help somebody else so that they can come out as true and authentic as they can. Well, and we hear a lot of the negative rhetoric of exposing people to this information Mm -hmm. is what creates this situation. Mm -hmm. But you said yourself, I didn't see people like me. So, I mean, you can only go back just a little bit (laughs) to say, I didn't see someone like me and I still felt this way and I still had this. And then when I saw it, it all clicked and that is me. Yes. So the exposure is not the catalyst to any of these situations. If, I mean, just across the board, the thing that ruins society and ruins culture is ignorance. If we just have the information at someone else's, at our leisure, it's the choice. Don't take away a choice because that really could be detrimental for so many young people. And especially nowadays where people are so free and now they do have the choice. And it's really, looking at my nieces, it is so not a big deal. Nothing is a big deal to those beautiful young women. And it's so weird for me because I think about myself when I was their age and it was such, everything was such a big deal. And now they're just like, okay, Auntie Jamesy, no big deal. Right. Okay. They'll correct my parents and be like, her pronouns are she, her, her. And it's not that big of a deal for this new generation where I'm just like, that means that we're raising young people who are respectful and who are sparking joy. When I finally figured out who I was, when I saw it, it just sparked joy. Why would anybody want to take that away from anyone? That is crazy to me. Yeah. So I just want to spread joy and spit rainbows. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you do. And also you sweat glitter. Yeah. <laughs> Every encounter, yes. every encounter with you, even through social media, when I watch your behind the scenes videos, your energy and magnetism on set has to be infectious with everybody. Um, and so you add that to your skill set and your talents, and it just has to really create just this magical experience for people. I try to be a beacon of hope and light and positivity wherever I am, especially on set. As you know, they can it can be really stressful in those situations. It's being on any set can just be really, really stressful. And so if I can do my one part in making sure that somebody smiles or making sure that somebody has fun, I feel like you remember stuff better, especially as a dancer, if you're having fun doing it. And if I can just... I. If I can have fun, if we're not laughing, I don't want it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't want it. I just want happiness. I was watching the um, Run the World video yes. and trying to think about how in the world did all of that come together? <laughs> the the cinematography, the song, like what comes first? Do you listen to the song and you're dancing in your car, you're dancing yes. in your apartment, and you're yes. coming up, you're visualizing the movement and writing that down? And yes. It was weird, especially that one, especially being my first video, I'm going in there like, oh, I gotta do a great job, I gotta be perfect. So my (laughs) process normally is I just put a song on repeat. I don't even move until I get into the first day of rehearsal, so I have no idea if the dance move is gonna work. Oops. But it was shrouded in secrecy, so we couldn't get the song. I had oh my to goodness! Fly, could not get the song. <laughs> I had to fly to New York from LA, and I had two hours before she came in the studio to figure out what we, I was going to do to the song. Only your first job doing Only this. Only my first job. I Only mean, one of the biggest stars James, in the world. <laughs> let's make it any any more difficult. <laughs> Literally, I was like, how they sent like the song it sampled, but I was like, that doesn't make sense. I don't know what she's singing about. Right? Could, I wouldn't even give me a synopsis of oh, the song. Oh mercy! And so then we finally got in the studio, and Frank had to play it for me. He's like, okay, now you can hear it. Let's go. And two, I had two hours before she came in. She was like, okay, let me see what you came up with. And I had to dance in front of her. <laughs> oh! <laughs> the day I met her, thank God, she made me feel so comfortable. The first thing she said when she came in the studio, first of all, the studio door is open and it's like a Beyonce walking in a music video. Oh, yeah. The wind it billows. smells like heaven yes, and cotton and candy. Like and... in the wind with the oh, my revolving goodness. door. And the first thing she said, she was like, let me see your nails. I was like, oh, that's Uh-oh. my own girl. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so that really, that made me feel more at ease. And then I could dance and she, I, I felt com- more comfortable dancing. And then she saw it and she was like, okay, well, I want to learn this now. Like, when is rehearsal? I was like, oh God, now. Huh. 
And then from there, we rehearsed it, just the choreography, and we got uh, kind of the storyboard for the okay. video. And then we got on set, and I was like, oh, we are doing this. So you were on set for the shoot. Yes. And um, so in that particular shoot, you know, she's she's dancing in dirt. Yes. So that also, because as I'm watching it, I'm thinking about, okay, what did James do? Yeah. Um, <laughs> what would James do? Yes. Um, and so you're like, wait, kick it a little bit more because the dirt motion, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Literally, like I was saying earlier, when I found out Tina Lane, it was like beside the camera doing them. I was the person, I got pulled literally to stand right beside the camera and I had to yell at her. I had to be like, point at the sun, lick your finger, twirl your hair, stomp in the grass. And then when we did got to the choreography, I, I was literally by the camera, my back facing her so she could see it in the right direction, doing the choreography full out, every take. Every take. Shout out to Danielle Polanco. I'll never forget because she was doing all her thank yous. And Danielle was like, shout out to James. She's going full out there beside the camera. And V was like, that's right. It was a wild, wild thing. In the dirt. She was going to dance in heels. Yeah. In the dirt. And we were like, Miss she did one take in heels. That's how incredible she is and how adventurous she is. Mm. But, I mean, it is dirt, girl. You will break your ankle. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was watching it like, closely. Yes. We had to be like, no, you cannot wear these pumps at the end of that video in this section in the dirt. And so she switched to a very, very chunky, chunky, chunky heel yeah. so that she could be safe. And I was like, girl, please don't hurt yourself on my account. If I don't remember <laughs> any Super Bowl ever my entire <laughs> life, I will remember that she was dancing in heels yes. on turf, on grass. Yes. <laughs> like that, you know, you just uh, think about those small details of the level of professionalism yes. that that takes. And how difficult that is. That is not an easy feat. It yeah. really takes an incredible skill set to be able to do that that with such poise and class mm. and and such fervor like she's so she's so ferocious i'm so thankful for her i would learn i learned so much working with her i i will forever be in debt to her but i can watch that and see you in that movement <laughs> i can see your i can see your influence in those movements also knowing that you have that in there mm. you know um and then also flipping to the other side of the whitney houston movie yes. and, and that you have that in you too yes. and so your style of combining all the things that you love and all the things that make you up to translate into steps and moves and kicks and things like that. <laughs> it's the Whitney film was such a dream job because I uh, like there's Janet and a very close second is Whitney. And so it was re I really wanted to knock it out of the park because I've been studying her as a performer my entire life I feel like. And I really just wanted to do my best. And it also goes back into, you know, when I would clean on Saturday mornings and just being able to like really get into my body to embody womanhood and to embody femininity and really do that with the Whitney film, even if it was something as simple as just like raising a hand. I really just wanted to make sure it came from a place of purpose. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about us as women is that everything comes from a place of purpose. And I, I just wanted to help translate that on the film. Was there ever a time in your career you weren't going to be a dancer or a choreographer? Like, you you had the Target application. You're like, I'm going to be a manager. Uh, girl, <laughs> yes! Uh, when I moved to L.A., I, was, I had worked at Cheesecake Factory for a year. <laughs> and so I just transferred from Durham. Cheesecake Factory, I went to school at Chapel Hill, transferred from Durham. Uh, Cheesecake Factory to Cheesecake Factory at the Grove. Worked there for three days. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Worked there for three days, and I was like, okay, because I booked a commercial, but I booked it as a background. I didn't even, like, it was an extra. I thought I booked it as a dancer. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so it was the worst pay, and they weren't going to give me the day off, and I was like, I don't need this job anymore. I booked a commercial. <laughs> Wait. <laughs> You didn't even get craft services on that shoe. No. <laughs> At least Cheesecake Factory had a, a comp meal. <laughs> exactly. But I like the energy. Yes. I'm a dancer now yes. in I'm LA. Like, I booked it. I made it. <laughs> Girl, no, but I couldn't go back to Cheesecake Factory after the commercial. I worked at a shoe store. I worked at, I forget. I, oh, God, I did it. Because it took a really long time, actually, for my career to really take off. I was there for two years before I even got an agent, mm. before I got my first big break. It was two years. My roommate, my best friend, Danielle, that I moved with at the time, three months in, she got an agent immediately. 
And I was like, ugh. But I was like, okay, if it happens for her, it'll happen for me soon. A year and a half after that, I was like, yeah. okay, still an agent. So I definitely, it got to a point where I was like, okay, I think I might have to move back. Right when that, right when I thought that, I was like, no, stick it out. And then I booked a TV show, Step It Up and Dance. And it's been smooth sailing ever since. Thank you, Bravo. <laughs> I love that. It feels as if so many times the the comment is right when I was ready to quit. Yes, right. absolutely. It's the breaking point. And it's like, okay, you, what do you have in you? What is your gut telling you to do? And my gut told me to stick it out. And thank goodness I did. <laughs> <laughs> and you used a term earlier, James, that, I don't know, it made me pause and, and wince. Um, I can't re recall the exact verbiage, but you said that you and your friends were, like, specialty acts. Yes, yes. That seems not appropriate to... Yeah. Ugh, trust me, we know. <laughs> but that, really, people were trying to, at the time, pigeonhole us into this one category of performer they could not get past the fact that we could do the feminine so well and that we could do the boy so well they really couldn't get at the time so and I they didn't think the audiences would accept right that like oh yeah this is this is how it is right so we would come out kind of like as as the butt of the joke mm -hmm. and the, although we would dance and we would have our part and people would go crazy when we come out but then when you think about it you're literally being put in this one section so that people can laugh mm -hmm. and so that you can spark, not laugh at you necessarily, but just so you can just be that moment to break up mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. monotony of it. But it's still, nobody knew what else to do with us. So at the time, being just being effeminate was a specialty act. Yeah, and that goes to your obstacle of, um, as you described, being othered. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So then you also, because you're being othered, you have to fight even harder to be seen as the equivalent of everything else. I've been training just as hard my entire life to be a dancer and to do all of these different types of movement. But then at the time, people only saw you as such. And so mm -hmm. you really have to fight against it. You literally, it's like swimming against the current. But you have to stick with it because you, you really want it to be pioneers for the people coming up. Thank God for like John T. Moaning and Ramon Baines because they really came in and set the precedent. After, but it was all of us together. No, people only wanted to see us as the lady boys is how we were referred to back then. Mm -hmm. And uh, Almost goodness. gimmicky? Yes, 100%. We would be put in the crazy costumes like the tutus and the hair bows and mm -hmm. all the, it was colorful and it was vibrant, but it was literally like a gimmick. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and that diminishes a lot of your talents and yes. value. And, and the time. Yeah. And the hard work that you put in. Mm -hmm. Like, we, we put in a lot of work coming up as dancers, and then to just be seen as such, I really made, made it a point to make sure that my choreography could reach across mm. any and all genres, just so that I don't want to ever feel pigeonholed. Yeah. yeah, I love this so very much. Is there anything else you think is important that we, we share with the audience? Because this is an opportunity. Someone's come here, they found you, they're listening, they see themselves in you, or or someone in their lives they love. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything else you think is important that we, we share? Be kind, be kind to one another. It is so important to me to be kind. It goes such a long way and it's such a small act that gets forgotten a lot of times. In your career, just be kind no matter what. It feels devastating when you feel unseen or when you feel unheard, but be kind because people will remember how you make them feel. And once people remember how you make them feel, then you can move through spaces that you may not have thought you could. But so just be kind to one another. That's my that's my biggest thing. I love that. And do you, when you're on a set and there are other trans identified people there, is there an immediate like, oh my God, oh, no. thank it's you, like, yes. The first thing, I'm, hey sis. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey boo, how you doing? Of course, it, it, especially when for so long we, didn't see each other on set. So it's literally like, let's link up, grab my arm, and let's skip through this baby. <laughs> so it's it's beautiful, especially now having worked on Pose, which was so amazing for me to see so many trans women, specifically black trans women, living their best life and making a living in this world. Amazing, yes. incredible. 
So what uh, what's your next goal that we have to manifest? Ooh. Uh, We're manifestors I, here. I am here for it, honey. I'm gonna rub and get all this good juju. I uh, oh, what do I wanna do? Uh I, I, I want to get into the award show world. I want to like choreograph opening numbers for the Emmys and the Oscars. And I really want to bring back choreography to the Oscars. There's a choreography category for Emmys and all the other award shows, but not for the Oscars. But the musical films are always the ones that win. And the only people left out are choreographers. So I really want to put that into the zeitgeist. I want choreography at the Oscars, darling. Done. <laughs> done and done. <laughs> Done and done. I love this. Done this done. is such an attainable goal in such a very short amount of time for I'm you. From your lips, I'm excited. I hope so. I love this. <laughs> James, thank you so much for sharing your thank story you. and for, for being in our studio today. We are honored to have you here. I'm honored to have you here. And I, I, I'm excited to follow along your behind the scenes and, and shake a little bit in the okay. car. Okay. <laughs> That's mission accomplished. That's all we want. Get people moving. That's all we want. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me and congratulations. Oh, thanks. Yay. Oh, it's a journey. It's a journey. All right. Oscars. Oscars. Next stop. Come on. Oscars. Yes. We're coming. <laughs> that is such an attainable goal for you. I hope so. I hope so. Oh, man. Oh. This She Dreams in Color interview series is part of the mission and purpose of the She Dreams in Color Foundation. The foundation works to provide free therapy to women who are marginalized, but also to destigmatize mental illness and the need for mental health care. So one of the ways we're able to raise money for the therapy that we provide the community is through merchandise. So this shirt, a work of art, was designed by Charlotte graphic designer Daps Designs, Dominique Prescott, and is for sale on our website. We also also have merchandise like mugs, notebooks, and stickers, and every purchase, all of the proceeds go directly to the foundation and is a tax write-off. Thank you for supporting our cause and our foundation, and thank you for being an audience member.